If you would open your Bible with me, I invite you this morning now to turn to Exodus chapter 8. And if you are new with us this morning, we are glad that you are here. And we are in a sermon series on the book of Exodus where we are just walking through this book chapter by chapter. And uh, we find ourselves this morning in the middle of this section, chapter 7 through 12 roughly, uh, looks at these 10 plagues that God sent upon the land of Egypt. And last Sunday, if you were with us, uh, we looked at the first three of those plagues. Today, we're going to look at the next three. And so we'll be starting in chapter eight, Exodus chapter eight, and in verse 20, going through chapter nine, verse 12. So hear now the word of the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. Or else if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand." But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus, I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by swarms of flies. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, It would not be right to do so, for the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, in the wilderness. Only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Then Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did as Moses asked, and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people. Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also, and did not let the people go. Then the Lord said to Moses, go in to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And the Lord set a time saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. And the next day the Lord did this thing. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh and Moses threw it in the air and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Pharaoh because of the boils for the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, and we are mindful of your hand, which is so apparent in these pages and the way in which, Lord, your hand is worked out, uh, your purposes are worked out, both through salvation and through judgment. 
Lord, we pray that you would help us as we meditate upon these verses to understand more of who you are and who you call us to be so that we might live faithfully in this day. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this summer, the uh, city of Paris will host the Summer Olympics. And um, how many of you are fans of the Olympics? How many of you watch the Olympics? Just curious. Uh, but at least half of you. Or I can't tell. Some people don't like to raise their hands up very high. You're afraid you might get called on or something. Um, <laughs> Summer Olympics are coming up. It only happens every four years. Of course, the Olymp uh, Winter Olympics happen in between. But um, during the Olympics, athletes, of course, compete in all these different events. And many of the classic ones that we know and, and love watching, such as track and field events, uh, gymnastics, swimming and diving, and, and, and many other games and, and events as well. Um, uh, besides the ones that we, we tend to see most on on the, the TV, uh, there are many others. And one sport that has been part of the Olympic Games since 1904 is Olympic boxing. Now, I've never really been a fan of watching boxing myself. I don't particularly have a desire to watch two guys try to beat the living daylights out of each other. But um, I'm sure that they, uh, the Olympic boxers are great athletes in their own respect, just like all the other athletes that compete. And in a boxing match, of course, you, you win if you knock your opponent out. But of course, in many boxing matches, nobody gets knocked out. And so they have to determine who the winner is by some other means. And I am told by people who know more about this than I do, that one of the main criteria that they use to determine who the winner is, is how many punches that uh, a boxer will land on his opponent. And the person who lands the most punches or lands the most blows will get the most points. And then, of course, the one who gets the most points is the victor. Well, I bring this up because one of the ways that the chapters we're reading, Exodus 7 through 12, could be described is a boxing match. This is a boxing match between God and Pharaoh. However, in this boxing match, God's the only one doing the punching. And Pharaoh is the only one who's getting knocked down. <laughs> um, I say that, and I use that analogy because I think it's quite appropriate. Back in chapter 3, God said, I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. With each and every plague, what God was doing is landing another blow on Pharaoh. He was landing another punch. He was giving another strike. And in fact, if, interestingly enough, the English word plague comes from a Latin word, which means a blow or a wound. And so I think it's very appropriate here to use this analogy that God is continuing to give blow after blow to Pharaoh until he's going to deliver the final blow in chapter 12. And we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. But today, we're going to examine the fourth and fifth and sixth blows. The fourth and fifth and sixth plagues. And you're going to see that God's judgment in these plagues is intensifying. And not just God's judgment intensifying, but the other thing that we're going to see happening is God makes a distinction between his people and Pharaoh's people. And that distinction is going to be very important. So let's look at the fourth plague together. And if you turn to chapter 8, verse 20, we see these words again. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say, to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me, or else if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. Now, with each successive play, God is revealing his power in a new way. If you think about it with me, the first two plagues, the, the river of blood and the frogs, showed that God had power over the waters and controlled both the waters and what came out of those waters. And then the third plague, the gnats, came from the dust of the ground and God showed that he had power over the earth and, and the, the, the dirt of the earth. And now this plague, this fourth plague, comes from the air, and God is demonstrating he's not just sovereign over the waters, he's not just sovereign over the ground, he's sovereign over the air as well. And not just that, but in this plague, God, for the first time, makes a distinction. 
a distinction that has not been introduced yet. And that, in verse 22, we see, God says, But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen. In the first three plagues, it doesn't say that God made a distinction between his people and Pharaoh's people. But now God is saying, I will make a distinction. I will make a division between my people and your people. In other words, when this plague arrives, it will affect the Egyptians, but it is not going to affect the Israelites. Verse 24 says, And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by swarms of flies. Now, think about this a minute. The flies are not such a big deal in small quantities. But in large quantities, flies are enough to drive a person practically to insanity, right? Right? Uh, I remember last year, I don't know what it was last year, but last year was the year of the invasion of black flies in our basement. You know those big, those big old black flies, and sometimes they find a way in, and then it's just like all of a sudden they start multiplying, right? So somehow, it was just in the basement, we had the invasion of some of these big black flies. And I went to war. I went to war against these flies. I'm I'm serious. And I'm, I am not kidding when I tell you, I got so good with a fly swatter, I could hit them right out of midair. I didn't even, they didn't have to be on the wall. I literally was doing like martial arts with a, with a fly swatter and I could hit them right out of midair. But it didn't matter because they just kept coming and they kept coming and they kept coming. Finally, I had to resort to other measures and, and get fly paper and all kinds of other things. Um, but, you know, it, that was bad enough. Imagine the situation with Pharaoh. And the millions upon billions upon trillions of flies that were infesting his land and in his house. And oh, by the way, it's quite possible these might have been biting flies as well. We all know how maddening it can be to have just a couple of deer flies that won't leave you alone. You're trying to take a walk in the woods or something and those things just attack you, right? Imagine billions of them covering every wall of your house and the floors and the furniture and every single thing that moves is covered in these. This is an absolutely terrifying plague. No wonder it says in verse 24, it says the the land was ruined by these swarms. The flies were bad enough that Pharaoh began to beg for mercy. Verse 25 says, Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, it would not be right to do so, for the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings uh, abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. Now, this is interesting because Moses is trying to strike a bargain with, uh, uh, Pharaoh is trying to uh, strike a bargain with Moses. He says, I'll let you go, and you can go do your sacrifices as long as you stay within the land. But Moses knew that wasn't good enough, and Moses refused to compromise. He knew, and this is really important, Moses knew that there had to be complete deliverance or none at all. There could not be freedom if the people still had one foot in the land of Egypt. That was not going to work. And you know, there there is a lesson here that really tells us something about the Christian life, and that is that Jesus came to deliver us from our own slavery to sin and to our old way of life. And he came to deliver us completely. He calls us to himself, and when he calls us to himself, he calls us to leave our old way of life behind completely, not to leave one foot back in the old way of life. Charles Spurgeon talked about this, and he wrote this. He said, God's demand is not that his people should have some little liberty, some little rest in their sin. No, but that they should go right out of Egypt. Christ did not come into the world merely to make our sin more tolerable, but to deliver us right away from it. He did not come to make hell less hot or sin less damnable or our lusts less mighty, but to put all these things far away from his people and work out a full and complete deliverance. 
The deliverance must be complete or else there shall be no deliverance at all. What Spurgeon was saying is that God didn't come so that we could leave one foot back in Egypt. Christ came to save us so that we could be called to complete deliverance into a new way of life. Moses understood that there had to be complete deliverance from Egypt or none at all. And so he wouldn't compromise. Verse 28 says then, Pharaoh said, okay, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you must not go very far away. Plead with me or plead for me, I should say. It's the second time now Pharaoh is saying, please ask God on my behalf to take away this plague. And Moses, again, does it. He prays to God. He asks God to take away the plague. And God takes away the plague. But guess what? Mo, uh, Pharaoh hardens his heart again, and he does not let the people go. So that brings us to the fifth plague. Chapter 9, verse 1 says, the Lord, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the land of the Lord, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And the Lord set a time saying, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. Now again, I want you to see that the plagues are intensifying in severity because in the previous, uh, pre the free previous three plagues with the frogs, the gnats, and the flies, God was attacking first and foremost the comfort of the Egyptians. But now with this plague, he's attacking not just the comfort, but their very livelihood. He is attacking their livestock, which of course, livestock would not have just been a source of, of food, but would have been a primary resource, uh, a primary means of any wealth, uh, a primary means of, in some cases, transportation. This would have been a devastating blow to the Egyptians. And once again, it says God is going to make a distinction. The livestock of Egypt would die. The livestock of the Israelites would live. Verse 6 then says this, the next day the Lord did this thing. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. I think it's interesting that, that after this happens, it says that Pharaoh sent to see what had happened to the Israelites' livestock. He went and sent to investigate what had happened. He wanted to see if what Moses had said was going to happen did in fact actually happen. He wanted to see if this miraculous distinction, this divine distinction really took place. And when he uh, sought it out, he saw that it did take place. And yet, amazingly, he still refused to surrender to God because his heart was hardened. You know, as I said last week, the issue for Pharaoh was not the evidence. He had plenty of evidence that God was supreme and God was sovereign. But the problem was he refused to accept that evidence. And you know, here again, there's a lesson for us today. Um, there are many people who want to investigate God today. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing to investigate who God is, to investigate the claims of Christ. But there comes a time when you have to stop investigating and you have to start believing. Because if a person has been given, like Pharaoh, in the case of Pharaoh, if a person has been given adequate, more than adequate evidence and still refuses to believe, the problem is not with the evidence anymore. The problem is with the heart. And this is what we see with Pharaoh. Pharaoh saw the power of God for the fifth time, but he still refused to believe. His heart remained hardened. He refused to surrender. So that brings us to the sixth plague. Chapter 9, verse 8. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from the kiln and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. 
So they took soot from the kiln and took, stood before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it in the air, and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And so here, with the sixth plague, we see things are getting even more personal now, aren't they? Now it's not just the comfort of the Egyptians that have been taken away. It's not just the livestock that have been attacked, but now the bodies of the Egyptians themselves are being attacked and their lives are being threatened. And once again, several things you can see here, the Egyptian gods are being exposed. I told you last week that the Egyptians worshipped many different gods. We only looked at a few of them, but there were many different gods the Egyptians worshipped. And they believed that the gods uh, could heal them from their diseases. They had many different ways in which they worshipped certain gods to provide healing from different things. And in this plague, what God is showing is that their gods are completely powerless to heal them. They could cry out to their gods all day long. Their gods were not going to heal them because God was the one who was superior and who was sovereign. And not only were the Egyptian gods being exposed, but I want you to see that the Egyptian magicians were being humiliated. Verse 11 says, The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. Now that's really interesting, because if you think back, after the first two plagues, the magicians were able to stand before uh, before Moses, and they were able to replicate the plagues. And then after the next plagues, uh, after the third, fourth, and fifth plagues, they were still able to stand before Moses, but they weren't able to replicate the plagues. Now, after the sixth plague, not only can they not replicate it, but they can't even stand before Moses. So do you see how this is progressing? They can't even stand before him because these boils are so bad, they are so painful. And notice once again, what does God do? He makes a distinction. Uh, it's, it's more subtle here, but it's made clear that it says the boils came upon the magicians and upon the Egyptians, but not upon the Israelites, because God has maintained this divine distinction. Now, what should Pharaoh have done? At this moment in time, what should Pharaoh have done? The same thing he should have done after all of the plagues. He should have repented. He should have surrendered to the Lord and acknowledged God's authority and superiority. But his heart remained hardened. Now, I know that some of you are sitting here thinking, but wait a minute, Stephen. Uh, verse 12 says, The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. And so many people ask, how can we hold Pharaoh responsible for his continued stubbornness, his continued hardness of heart, when it says that the Lord was the one who hardened his heart? Here we need to remember something that I mentioned a few weeks ago, and that is that the hardness of Pharaoh's heart is somewhat mysterious. It's described in three different ways if you read through the book of Exodus. And actually, you saw all three of them in our passage that we read today. After the fourth plague, we were told in verse 32 of chapter 8 that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. He's held responsible. And then in the fifth plague, after the fifth plague, it says in chapter 9, verse 7, very simply, it just says that the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. It, it just kind of states it neutrally. It doesn't say that he hardened his heart. It doesn't say that God hardened his heart. It just talks about his heart being hardened. And then after the sixth plague, it says in chapter 9, verse 12, that the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And so we see, interestingly enough, the, the hardness of Pharaoh's heart described in three different ways. And there is some mystery here, but we need to understand two things. Number one, yes, it is true that the Lord and his sovereignty did harden Pharaoh's heart. And yet at the same time, that sovereignty of God is held up alongside Pharaoh's own responsibility. And this, the text does say that Pharaoh was also responsible for hardening his heart. He's not relieved of that responsibility and his own sin was part of that hardening as well. God, in his sovereignty, did harden Pharaoh's heart. And because he hardened his heart, and because Pharaoh hardened his own heart, he brought disaster upon his own people. Now, as we come to a close today, I want to come back to the theme that we see running through these 
these, this set of plagues, four, five, and six. Because as I said, that, that one of the themes that comes up in this set of three is the divine distinction that God makes between his people and Pharaoh's people. In chapter 8, verse 23, going back, it says, I will put a division between my people and your people. And the question I want to ask as we close this morning is, on what basis did God make that distinction? Why did God choose the Israelites to be his people? How was it that they were his people and that there was this distinction between God's people and Pharaoh's people? Well, let me tell you something. It was not because they were the most mighty people. It was not because they were the most holy people, and it was not because they were the most lovable people, <laughs> as you see if you continue reading your Old Testament. In fact, later on, after God brought the people out of Egypt and they were preparing to enter the promised land, Moses himself would remind them of this and would make it very clear. Here's what he says in Deuteronomy 7. He says to the people, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. What that text tells us is that the Israelites were chosen by God's grace and they were saved by God's grace. And what I want you to hear this morning is this. That same reality is true for every single person who belongs to the people of God today. Salvation is still by God's grace. God's people are still his people by his grace alone. Not because they, they are the holiest people, not because they are the most lovable people, not because of any other quality except because of God's grace. Listen to these words from Philip Graham Ryken. He writes, When Jesus died on the cross, it was the greatest exodus of all. God took people who were in such bondage to sin that they were completely unable to deliver themselves. They were as hopeless and helpless as the Israelites, but God did for them what he did for Israel. He sent a redeemer to rescue them from their slavery to sin by paying their ransom with his very own blood. And now... His cross rightly discriminates between those who are God's people and those who are not. God's people are those, are the ones who put their trust in Christ and in his cross. But anyone who does not believe in Jesus Christ is outside the people of God. Scripture tells us that just as God made a distinction between his people and Pharaoh's people during the day of the plagues, if you read the rest of, of the book, <laughs> you see that at the end, on the very last day, God will make a distinction. And he's going to make a distinction, and there's only going to be two groups of people. There are going to be those who are God's people, and there are going to be those who are not his people. And here's the dividing line. The dividing line will be his son, Jesus Christ. That is the dividing line that separates all the peoples of the earth. On that day, on the final day, it's not going to matter what uh, nationality you are. It's not going to matter what skin color you have. It's not going to matter how much money you made. It's not going to matter how many good works you have done. The only thing that is going to matter is if you have surrendered to Jesus Christ and joined yourself to him in faith. That's it. That is it. Because he is the dividing line. He is the only dividing line that determines who are God's people and who are not. So if you're here this morning and you have not joined yourself to Jesus Christ in faith, let me ask you, why have you not? Why not? What is stopping you from doing that? We like to ask, well, what was stopping Pharaoh from acknowledging God time after time after time? I want to ask you, what is stopping you today? Salvation in Moses' day was by grace, and it was only by grace, and it's still by grace today. And as I said, Jesus is the great dividing line between those who are God's people and those who aren't. And this is a reminder to us that if you are one of God's people, 
If you are one of God's people, you have no one to thank but God. You have nothing to boast about because it's only by his grace that you are one of his people. And if you are not yet part of God's people, you can be because you don't need to harden your heart like Pharaoh did and refuse to accept what you see before your eyes. Instead, you can surrender to Jesus. You can join yourself to him in faith now. Because the promise is that for those who do, for those who do join themselves to Jesus Christ in faith, there is deliverance. And there is deliverance from sin right now. And there is the promise of deliverance from judgment on the last day. So what's stopping you from doing that? If there is anything that has stopped you from doing that up to this point, I pray that today would be the last day that you let anything stop you and that you would join yourself to Jesus in faith. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you remind us in these verses that we read of how great you are, how powerful you are, Lord, you remind us that that you are sovereign over our lives. And sometimes we resist that sovereignty, Lord. We acknowledge to you. Sometimes we push against it. Sometimes we don't want to surrender before you. But Lord, we pray that you'd help us to do that. Help us to set aside all of our doubts, all of our stubbornness, Lord, we pray that you would help us to accept who you are and trust in you, knowing that there is salvation in no one else and nowhere else. Lord, remind us daily that if we are part of your people, it is not because of anything within ourselves, but because of your grace and your love. And may that free us to live lives of holy obedience to you, Obeying all of your commands, Lord, but also being ready and willing and eager to point others to you. To point others to you, knowing that you alone are God, you alone are King, and you alone are Savior. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.